Hey everybody, it's Tim from Shui Media and the producer of America the Podcast. I just wanted to say thank you all for listening this season. It has been such a thrill making this show and getting to teach everybody about history, something that a lot of us didn't really learn the real version of when we were in high school and elementary school and middle school. Said those out of order. Did I do it on purpose? Maybe. Or maybe I went to school out of order. Maybe I started high school first, and maybe I then went to elementary school and up to middle school. I know I did college right out of the womb. Anyway, I specifically wanted to thank everybody who helped make this show happen this year. Uh, Alana Matos, Michael Sizemore, Andrew Turner, Alexa Schreffler, and Raya Harper. You guys helped so much, and I could not have done this show without you. Probably could have done it without Feb, but uh, then uh, we wouldn't have been able to travel through time, so I don't know. That said, if you are still listening at this point and haven't skipped ahead to the Real American commercial and you like this show, please consider giving us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us, you know, climb that little algorithm so people can find the show. And uh, luckily, people have actually found the show because we were just listed on the 25 best comedy talk shows on Feedspot um, as a real honor, and we're real happy to do it. And, uh, uh yeah. Hell? So, uh-oh. What are you doing in here? I'm just thanking people for listening to this season and, uh, asking them to rate and review the show. You lose the episode, and now you feel it necessary to record without me. I told you you cannot use the studio without my permission. It's my studio. I own the building. I'll show you who owns what. Get over here! Ah, thanks for listening. Send help! <laughs> This episode of America the Podcast is brought to you by QAnon Light, a product of the Real American Company. Hey there, friend. You look glum. What's that you say? Your family disowned you for being a member of QAnon. You say they don't want to speak with you because you believe the actual conspiracy theories such as online furniture retailer Wayfair traffics children in the cabinets they sell, JFK Jr. is still alive and is actually the infamous Q, Bill Gates put tracking chips in the COVID-19 vaccine. Donald Trump is still president. And of course, the one and only Pizzagate. Well, wash those cock tears away because have I got a solution for you! Introducing QAnon Light from the Real American Company. With QAnon Light, you can finally spew as many poorly researched theories as you want directly into social media and your snowflake family will be none the wiser. How does it work, you ask? Great question, but also, who's asking? Are you some sort of deep state agent? No? Hmm, that is what a deep state agent would say, but I'll believe you due to your kind face and try to look past those dead eyes of yours. Yes, QAnon Light reads your batshit social media posts and filters them so they seem less unhinged to your loved ones. For example, instead of Italians used secret satellites to hack American voting systems during the 2020 election, the sheeple in your family will see an article on 20 hacks for Italian cooking. Do you want to post something about Joe Biden being a secret lizard person who drinks baby's blood with Hillary Clinton? No worries, post away my misinformed friend. The only thing your family will see is a picture of Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton holding a smiling baby. And that's not all! We're currently in the product testing phase of the new QAnon Light face mask. Wait, 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 hold on, don't walk away. I know you're feeling about face masks, but hear me out. With the QAnon face mask, not only will your family allow you into the house now that you're wearing a mask, but the mask itself will filter out all risky phrases such as COVID-19 was manufactured by the Democrats. Or, yeah, I stormed the Capitol on January 6th. And even, my name is Ben Shapiro. Yes, from Jewish space lasers to Rudy Giuliani is my personal lawyer, we've got you covered. That's QAnon Light from The Real American Company, available wherever freedom is sold. Product may not work on Marjorie Taylor Greene. My dear Lord Shelburne, I hope this letter finds you well. You may not know who I am at the moment, but I assure you as our great American nation grows, you will come to know my very important name. But enough about me, let's discuss you and our treaty. First, I must say congratulations on becoming the new Prime Minister of England. Let us hope, for your sake, that you do better than your predecessor, Lord North. Otherwise, we might end up right back where we started. Speaking of, what a war, huh? 
I do say it appears we decimated your army time and again and even accepted the surrender of Lord Cornwallis, which to me is the definition of winning a war, yet somehow our treaty has still not been signed by your government. My friends in Paris, Mr. Adams, Mr. Franklin, and Mr. Jay, would love to come home, yet your king seems resistant to the idea of a peaceful transition from war and into America becoming a sovereign nation. If his majesty would like, he can come back to America, and our army would gladly lay waste to the crown's forces once again. However, I have personally grown tired of the bloodshed, for the moment at least, and have heard you are a reasonable man. Assuming I have heard correctly, allow me to offer a bit of advice. Consider this. America is not only far away from England, but your own people have proclaimed that they want nothing to do with your war against American independence. Not only that, I suspect that the cost of war has been bleeding the crown's purse of its riches for some time now. Considering I am never wrong, it would be a wise man's decision to end your war with us and save what coin you can. Because let us face facts. You will likely need all of the silver and gold you have left when you inevitably go to war with France in a few years' time. That said, I propose the following. Meet our demands and you will no longer waste time and resources controlling former colonies that want nothing to do with your monarchy. By signing our treaty, you have a new trading partner without being burdened with administrative and defense costs. With our tentative friendship, you may reap the benefits of our great nation's prosperity and we will do the same with yours. Simply put, think of the money, my dear Lord Shelburne. Capitalism is kind to those who heed its opportunities. I leave the decision to you and pray you make the sensible one. Yours truly, Thebadias A. Stard, the embodiment of and only hope for America and her people. P.S. Tell Ben Franklin, I said, thanks for the clause. He'll know what it means. Back. Hello, America. It's America, the podcast. So are you still close with your mom and your sisters? You mentioned them in the last episode, and I'm sure that opened up a slew of questions from our listeners. Oh, yes. I am still very close with them. How are they still alive? Well, if you listen to my very important mini-episodes, you would hear my very important segment, Semi-Important Questions, in which I already addressed this. But for those of you who may have missed my magnificent answer, since my mother and sisters are bound to me by blood, they too have been granted immortality. It's a sort of Fred Claus situation. Like the Christmas movie with Vince Vaughn and Paul Giamatti? Fellow Skull and Bonesman Paul Giamatti, yes. It is a movie based on actual historical events, much like this current season of America! The podcast presents the American Revolution, and many more seasons after. Huh, crazy. I'll have to ask Santa about that if we see him again at this year's War on Christmas. Um, wait, so how often do you get to see your family? Oh, some holidays and birthdays if I can, but usually just during the War on Christmas. It's a wonderful time of year indeed. I do always love traveling out to my mother's ranch in northern Montana. Uh, should we bleep that? Why? For, like, your family's safety? You've made a lot of enemies over the years, dude. Plus, the curious members of the public and the press could post up outside their house. Eh, I'm not worried about my family. It's everyone else who should be worried. What do you mean? Well, I'll put it this way. In the early days of World War II, three Nazi assassins found out where my family lived and proceeded to try and take them out while I was away. Only one assassin was left alive, albeit dismembered by my sisters, and still shipped back to Germany in pieces, with a note from my mother pinned to his bare chest reading, Good try, dirtbags. I told my son what happened. America is coming for you. Jesus. Moral of the story, don't mess with Lady Liberty and her kids. That's my mom's name. Liberty starred. What about your sisters? Eh, I'll give those out at the next season finale. Speaking of, it's time to close out season five with the best thing to ever exist. Pizza? Well, pizza is an obvious close second. That is not the greatest thing to ever exist. Well... Quiet, you. It's time to tell the story of the United States of America. Tonight on America the Podcast. <laughs> Wait, 
we already did the intro music. What? I didn't hear it. Okay, well, it's technically added in post, but it's gonna come up after your letter to Lord Shelburne. Well, can we not play it again? It's a real banger. We can only afford to play it once. Otherwise, we have to pay the composer another thousand dollars. But you are the composer of my magnificent theme song, are you not? Well, yeah. So would you not just be paying yourself? Yes and no, but it's just a tax thing I don't really want to deal with. Ah, say no more. I am all for avoiding taxes. Yeah, right, okay, whatever. Well, let's just get into scene two. It's on page three. Do you enjoy taking the magic out of my magnificent show? A little. Hmm, very well then. I guess I can't fault a fellow tax dodger for being a dirtbag. I'm not a tax dodger. It's fine. Your secret is safe with me and the rest of the 0.01%. I'm not- shh, 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 shh. It's fine, my friend. Your transformation into a corrupt tax evasion expert is finally complete. My work here is done, and now, on with my very important story. Oh, uh, fine. It's not worth it. All right, um, so we did the Battle of Yorktown last time. What is there to talk about now? The war's over. The war with the British may be done, but America's war with itself had just begun. Our story begins in January 1783. Rumors had begun circulating about a potential peace deal with England that had been struck in Paris. With our war finally over-ish, our army had begun to get a bit antsy, as many servicemen had not been paid for some time. Not to mention the growing resentment of Congress among the troops for lack of said pay. Why didn't y'all just pay them? Because of a clause in the Articles of Confederation, which served as a loose constitution during the war and for several years after. Under the Articles, Congress had no power to truly tax anyone despite offering to give every service member a post-war pension of half their pay for the rest of their lives, a promise they could not keep. The country's war financier, Robert Morris, had been trying to get the states to pay for their war debts time and again since the end of the Battle of Yorktown. He even restructured the financial system to help do so. Back during the war, he had proposed an import tax to help fund the army, but had been shot down by Congress. Why didn't Congress approve the tax? Didn't they want to win the war? Ah, that would require amending the Articles of Confederation, which itself required a unanimous vote. Unfortunately for our soldiers, Rhode Island rejected the proposal, which then prompted Virginia to pull out, followed by the rest of the South. Ha! Huh, so Congress was as useful back then as they are now. Not quite. Under our magnificent, flaw-free Constitution, Congress has a bit more power than their revolutionary counterparts. Arguably too much power. Because of lobbyists like you! Indeed, and you are welcome. Unlike our godlike Congress of today, the Congress under the Articles was uh, more or less an advisory board versus an actual ruling body. Since there wasn't a federal government yet, taxing was up to the individual states, and most states didn't really want to comply. But that matter would sort of uh, get solved in the coming years. On January 6th, right after some not-so-secret planning with Robert Morris and the newly elected statesman Alexander Hamilton, General McDougall arrived in Philadelphia to address Congress and deliver a letter that detailed the grievances of the military. Huh, that's a little ironic. What is? Uh, I mean, you know, the fact that people showed up to the Capitol on January 6th and demanded things from Congress. Eh, it's not the same thing. These men simply wanted the promised pensions for those who fought for the American Revolution. Those who were involved in the January 6th insurrection are quite simply terrorists who deserve to go to Alcatraz. I don't think Alcatraz is an active prison anymore. Oh no! If only I knew someone with a vast amount of money that rivals the combined fortunes of King Solomon, Scrooge McDuck, and Mansa Musa that could buy Alcatraz and turn it into a prison for traitors to American democracy. Oh wait, I do, and it's me! Okay, chill out, no need for sarcasm. Well, I learned it from the best, by E. General McDougal. Real sarcastic guy. When Congress asked him what would happen if they didn't pay the soldiers, the general went as far as to not so lightly threaten mutiny if the soldiers didn't get their back pay and promised pensions. When this happened, Robert Morris gave up and resigned in front of Congress. Since this would have likely kickstarted the already promised mutiny, a vote was held to keep his resignation secret. After that, Congress voted to not pay the troops their back pay or their pensions in an 8-5 to five vote and proposed to disband the army to avoid paying them altogether. This caused General McDougall to write General Knox, telling him to prepare for a mutiny and to refuse any disbursement order. McDougall had already written Knox several times to ask for guidance on the matter, but those letters went unanswered. This new letter also went unanswered, which led to the consideration of relying on the radicals in the army. 
Radicals? Indeed. At this point, the anger amongst our men had manifested so much that certain factions began to discuss marching on Congress itself. Major John Armstrong Jr., second in command to Horatio Gates, penned a letter that criticized Congress, General Washington, and called for a military coup unless they received pay. The letter itself was anonymous at the time and began circulating at our camp on March 10th. Oh shit, I know we discussed Gates being kind of a traitor before. Was he involved in this? Officially, no, but speaking as someone who knew Horatio Gates for many years, I can say unequivocally that that man was indeed involved. There is no way a general of his status wouldn't know what his own men are up to. Plus, he had already been involved in Conway's cabal that aimed to overthrow General Washington, which itself would have succeeded if not for Lafayette. Dang, how close did they get to a coup? Well, that's a matter of perspective, really. Most of those involved wanted to install General Washington as a king and create a constitutional monarchy, specifically a man named Louis Nicola, who wrote a letter to Washington calling for his rise to royalty. In their eyes, they were close to completing their coup, but in the eyes of people like myself and General Washington, they were nowhere close. We didn't fight a war against a king just to replace it with another. Pure stupidity. Anyways, a second letter that had been published at the same time as the first called for a meeting of all senior officers to take place on the 11th. When Washington heard this, he refused the request and wrote a letter ordering the meeting to instead take place on March 15th, aka the Ides of March, aka Roman Debt Settling Day, and aka the anniversary of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Washington signaled that he wouldn't even attend the meeting, thinking the officers would just chill out. However, another letter was released on the 12th which more or less claimed that Washington's willingness to allow the meeting was an endorsement of the coup itself. I take it that wasn't the case? Absolutely not. The morning of the 15th came and the senior officers met inside a building at the camp. As General Gates called the meeting to order, I entered the room, followed by Washington, General Knox, and a few other officers. Attention! It's General Washington. General Washington. General Washington. General Washington. General Washington. General Washington. I'd like to address my men if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Ahem. Good morning. By an anonymous summons, an attempt has been made to convene you together. How inconsistent with the rules of propriety, how unmilitary, and how subversive of all order and discipline. Let the good sense of the army decide. This feels like it's going to go on for a while. Actually, you're right. This does get a bit long, so I'll skip to the good part. <laughs> While I give you these assurances and pledge myself in the most unequivocal manner to exert whatever ability I am possessed of in your favor, let me entreat you, gentlemen, on your part, not to take any measures which, viewed in a calm light of reason, will lessen the dignity and sully the glory you have hitherto maintained. Let me request you to rely on the plighted faith of your country and place a full confidence in the purity of the intentions of Congress that previous to your dissolution as an army, they will cause all your accounts to be fairly liquidated as directed in their resolutions which were published to you two days ago and that they will adopt the most effectual measures in their power to render ample justice to you for your faithful and meritorious services. And let me conjure you in the name of our common country. As you value your own sacred honor, as you respect the rights of humanity, and as you regard the military and national character of America, to express your utmost horror and detestation of the man who wishes, under any specious pretenses, to overturn the liberties of our country, and who wickedly attempts to open the floodgates of civil discord and deluge our rising empire in blood. By thus determining and thus acting, you will pursue the plain and direct road to the attainment of your wishes. You will defeat the insidious designs of our enemies who are compelled to resort from open force to secret artifice. You will give them one more distinguished proof of unexampled patriotism and patient virtue rising superior to the pressure of the most complicated sufferings. And you will, by the dignity of your conduct, afford occasion for posterity to say when speaking of the glorious example you have exhibited to mankind, had this day been wanting, the world had never seen the last stage of perfection to which human nature is capable of attaining. Now, I have a letter from Congress I'd like to read. Oh, <laughs> 
Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. Now, where was I? Ah, yes. From the Continental Congress to the Continental Army, we the body of Congress state to you... Whoa, wait, weren't we just inside? Yes, but it smelled really bad in there, and George was basically done, so I magicked us out. Oh, right on. Uh, but dude, for real, if I've learned anything from traveling with you, it's that people in the 1700s smelled real bad. Exactly. Could I have shared that rubbing limes on one's armpits works as deodorant? Maybe. If I had revealed my secret, would I have won best-smelling American 245 years running? We may never know. Irregardless of the smell, being outside is much better. It's pleasant and I like the birds. Plus, everyone listening to Washington was crying like a bunch of babies. I have no time for sentiment. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, I saw a few men start sobbing when Washington put on his glasses. Indeed, that was my idea. What do you mean? Well, considering the unrest in our troops and the fact that they even suggested that Washington be king, we had to stamp out this insurrection hard and fast. I convinced General Washington that by showing his age and wear, it helped remind our troops what our friends and families had fought and died for. An act as simple as putting on his glasses squashed the insurrection right then and there. After Washington finished speaking, we left leaving General Knox in charge. The officers promptly drafted multiple resolutions, one completely renouncing the Newburgh conspiracy, one in support of General Liberty and whatnot, and one acknowledging the supremacy of Congress. <laughs> I'm sure Congress was relieved. Indeed. Washington wrote to Congress letting them know that they barely avoided a mutiny due to their incessant inactivity. Later that year, the general resigned his commission on December 23, 1783, and retired to his home in Virginia. He was called the American Cincinnatus, a Roman leader who led Rome through a crisis and then retired, giving up all of his power when it was over. As for Congress, they eventually settled with the army, promising a five-year pension at the end of one's term of military service, as opposed to the original promise of a lifetime pension. Damn, that sucks. At least they got something, I guess. Yes, well, that was the problem. It didn't happen. Unfortunately for the army, Rhode Island once again decided that a tax wasn't worth the cost of the thousands of lives lost in the name of liberty for their state and others. When they rejected the amendment, it was effectively dead. Following that, the peace treaty finally arrived from Paris, and Congress disbanded the army completely to avoid paying them. Jesus! Ugh, well, that tracks. I guess America really has been treating its veterans like shit from the very beginning. Pretty much. Robert Morris and I did pay as many people as possible out of our own pockets, though. As the richest men in America, we wanted to do what we could. Right, but there's no way everyone was cool with not getting paid. Were there any other coup attempts after Newburgh? Oh, there were several. Most notably when I, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay overthrew the government. Wait, you led an insurrection? Not quite. We just had the audacity to suggest that the Articles of Confederation might be flawed and that our new nation could benefit from a central government that could actually pay its debts. Ah, so you were about to tell us about how you four brought about the Constitutional Convention? More like how I made sure the Constitution was actually written and that we would actually have a stable government. And I will tell you how I succeeded and then some after I make some cash off our listeners. So now I must ask that you toss a coin to your witcher, O oh Valley of Plenty. God, I love that show. What do you mean, show? Uh, the Netflix show and video games about the Witcher, the Monster Hunter, the thing you just quoted? You mean to tell me that Netflix made a show about my side gig as a Witcher? Oh my God, you're a Witcher? Indeed, I- Actually, no, I'm not doing this. It's the last episode of the season and this is too silly. Just ugh, go to commercial. Okay, I guess you in America don't want to hear about how I killed an undead dragon. Oh, well- Nope, you blew it. America will never hear about how I killed Christopher, the zombie dragon king of Reno, Nevada. But- Nope, sorry, the moment's passed and America can send all of their hate mail to at Shway Media on Twitter. We'll be right back. It's America, the podcast. America, the podcast is brought to you by getting drunk in your 30s. Getting drunk in your 30s. No amount of Pedialyte can keep you from being hungover in your company meeting tomorrow.
Hello, America. It's me, Zebedee Zaystar, a.k.a. the embodiment of an only hope for America and host of America, the podcast, which I am pleased to report has been featured as lucky number 13 on the list of the 25 best comedy talk shows on all of the internet, according to Feedspot.com. And I am pleased as punch. So follow the link in the description of this episode or head over to Feedspot.com to check out all of the wonderful comedy podcasts on the curated comedy podcast lists of Feedspot.com. And now, on with more commercials. It's America, the podcast. And we're back with the season finale of America, the podcast presents the American Revolution. Dude, they know what they're listening to. Remember, your audience is more intelligent than you think. Son, my audience is made up of Americans. Do you really want to die on that hill? No. Yes, that's what I thought. Now let's continue with America, the podcast presents the American Revolution. Sometime after the Newburgh Conspiracy on June 20th, I believe, a group of soldiers marched on Congress in Philadelphia in order to peacefully protest not being paid. When Congress asked to have the Pennsylvania militia brought in to intervene, the president of the state refused since he was scared the militia would just join in on the protest. Angered by this act of civil disobedience, the future Broadway star and soldier-turned-statesman, Alexander Hamilton, convinced Congress to move the American capital to Princeton, New Jersey. I myself resigned my commission shortly after General Washington and moved to our new capital to help advise Congress. Once there, I struck up a more cordial friendship with Alex Hamilton, mostly because he had gained influence and I like collecting powerful friends. They're, uh, kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh cards to me. Whoa, wait, you play Yu-Gi-Oh? Not much anymore, but I do have a solid platinum Egyptian god card if anyone's looking to buy it. Right on, uh, how much? Fourteen million American dollars. Yeah, uh, pass. Uh, maybe Bezos or Elon will want to buy it? Ugh, Bezos already has one, and Elon is pumping all of his money into buying Twitter so that white people can tweet racial slurs again. However, I'm sure his quote-unquote free speech endeavors won't last long, and I'm absolutely positive that my statement will age like a fine wine. But not all aged wine is necessarily good. Exactly. Once Alex and I had begun hanging out more, we began to start toying with new versions of what the government could be since the articles were, objectively, a large pile of dog shit. We were soon joined by James Madison and John Jay, and together, we began writing a series of articles that would become known as the Federalist Papers, which, in a sense, were simply a case for a new constitution. These ideas that Alex would maniacally write down, sometimes on scrap pieces of paper, were pulled from the quote-unquote best parts of governments that came before us. The Federalists were mostly supported by city people and called for a strong federal government that could get our new nation out of debt, which would require taxation. Which is a thing y'all famously fought against. Uh, indeed. But as it turns out, taxes are necessary. Mind you, that doesn't mean I pay them or even want to do so, but that's a subject for a different time and out of the earshot of the IRS. Irregardless that we just fought a war against taxes, we still needed them to survive as a nation and the nation needed a federal government to implement them. To quote the Federalist Papers directly, nothing is more certain than the need for government and the people must give to the government some of their natural rights in order to provide it with power. I paraphrased there, but you get the picture. That kind of sounds like the opposite of what I assumed the majority of colonial Americans believed. You are partially correct, but as you know, the lessers are required to believe what their overlords tell them. Right, so, uh, okay, you mentioned Alex Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, but did you write any of the Federalist Papers? I'm kind of unclear on that. I wrote a few, but they were rejected by Hamilton and went unpublished because I called for a Bill of Rights. This caused me to not-so-secretly play both sides and help write some of the anti-Federalist papers. <laughs> That's a lazy name and seems made up. Yes, well, no one ever said statesmen were creative, and these were indeed real. The Anti-Federalists were mostly people from rural farming areas, especially ones that allowed slavery, and called for small government, which I was against, but they did call for a Bill of Rights. However, that is pretty much where my alliance with them stopped. They believed, quote, the limitation of government is the surest record of the happiness of the people, end quote. They were also not thrilled with any idea of having a central government. One of the anti-federalist papers states the following. 
after so recent a triumph of the British king, after the blood has been spent, it is truly astonishing that a set of men among our Americans would champion a government that would destroy our liberties. <laughs> Destroy our liberties is a little dramatic, don't you think? Agreed. They were a bit short-sighted and would have been happy with no government at all. They also would literally shit themselves if they saw our government today. It was never officially confirmed who wrote them, but as someone who knew these men personally, I can confirm that the authors of the Anti-Federalist Papers were Patrick Henry, Robert Yates, Samuel Byron, Richard Henry Lee, and one by Thomas Jefferson. I wrote one too, but they ended up rejecting mine because I thought we needed a centralized bank. There was no pleasing these people. <laughs> okay, so let me get this straight. The Federalists didn't want a Bill of Rights, but the slave-owning Anti-Federalists did want a Bill of Rights? You are correct. Hamilton argued that the Constitution limited the government enough to not require one. However, the lack of a Bill of Rights didn't really play a role until the Constitution was fully written. There were several issues that had to be worked out before our great constitution would be formed. So what exactly did each side believe? Well, first there was the Virginia plan, whose supporters wanted representation to be based on population, which meant larger states would have more representatives in Congress. The opposition to that was the New Jersey plan, which wanted equal representation by having each state send the same number of delegates. Well, that just sounds like the House and Senate of today. Ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, you get a cookie. Hey man, don't play with me. You already offered a cookie last episode and then didn't give me one. Yes, but this time I have a cookie for you. Here. What is this, walnut? Dude, are you trying to kill me? You're allergic to walnuts. Yeah, dude, I told you this so many times. Uh, why am I surprised he forgot? Shame on me. That's what it is. So you're allergic to walnuts. Interesting. I don't like the way you said that. Yes, well... The whole representation debate, as well as so many other debates, took place between May and September of 1787. A lot of us decided to meet in Philadelphia to begin work on a new constitution, with George Washington presiding over what would become known as the Constitutional Convention. On May 25th, we locked ourselves in a room and stayed there all summer long. And I will say this, if I wouldn't irreparably damage the time stream, I would go back and give John Adams a can of spray-on deodorant. He smelled, and I cannot stress this enough, so-so, so, 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 so bad. He even removed his shirt several times when arguing. I shit you not, I believe he may have been America's first chemical weapon. Oh my god, we're about to go there, aren't we? Well, it's either that or we go see what the children from Liberty's kids are up to. Your call. Uh, the convention. Very well. As the summer went on and the smell of dozens of old white men grew more pungent, the delegates from the convention were reaching a constitutional stalemate. No one could fully agree on how the country should be represented. If the New Jersey plan was adopted, states with high populations would have the same number of representatives as states with much smaller populations. If the Virginia plan was adopted, states with massive populations would essentially control the country through representation. The biggest worry there, however, was that the southern states with high enslaved people populations would have the most representation and thereby control the country. Whoa, man, hold on. Why was representing the enslaved people a bad thing? Oh, I'm not saying that it was. They just wouldn't actually be represented under the Constitution, just simply counted as part of the population to pad the South's people numbers, as messed up as that sounds. We're getting into the three-fifths compromise here, America, so prepare to be disgusted. Right, well, I'm... I'm afraid to ask, but I guess we're here. Uh, did you support the three-fifths compromise? Well, privately, absolutely not. But unfortunately, I had to do so publicly, albeit with a vocal disdain. I'm the embodiment of America, so compromise is kind of my whole thing. Without that terrible compromise, slave states like Virginia would have had too much power, and the scourge that is slavery would have started creeping back up to the northern states over time. Abolitionists like myself wanted to stop slavery's monstrous march to the north in any way we could. Slavery as a whole was already growing less and less popular by the day, but it would sadly be many, many, many years before it would end. I did continue doing what I could to free as many people as possible, though. Until they stopped you. Indeed. Don't worry, America. You'll hear me gleefully killing slave owners with my friends John Brown and Nat Turner soon enough. Two different episodes about me dismembering piece of shit slaver after piece of shit slaver. Hmm, sounds quaint. Exactly. Anyways, the convention was stuck between New Jersey and Virginia's ideas of representation, and it seemed like the whole new constitution idea might fall apart. Luckily for the country, I am a skilled double agent and negotiator. With my help and the help of my friends Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth, both representatives from Connecticut, mind you, 
we came up with a pretty good, nay, a great compromise. Here, watch. Where are you? Ah, I'm over there in the corner with Sherman and Ellsworth while these idiots rabble on. I will not be part of a country that uses enslaved people to bolster their numbers all in the name of power. The Virginia plan is rubbish. Equal representation for every state. The smaller states don't have any right to dictate what we do in the South. My God, these men will be the death of the country. And me. Any ideas, Mr. Sherman? I'm at my wit's end. Oliver, I have nothing. And the smell from John Adams is starting to get to me. Do you have any suggestions, Mr. Stard? Well, both plans are indeed valid, although I'm not thrilled with keeping slavery. Alas, thanks to those lazy southerners, abolition is a non-starter. Yes, all hope is lost there, I'm afraid. If only we could simply have two houses of representation, then they could simply balance each other out. You're right! It's so simple. You really think it could work? It couldn't hurt to ask. Right. Mr. Washington, I request permission to address the convention. Very well. The floor is yours, Mr. Stard. Order! Order! The chair recognizes Thebadias Stard of Massachusetts. Mr. Stard, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, I think I have it. We are simply getting nowhere with these ideas, so why don't we simply combine them? What are you proposing, Mr. Stard? Well, Mr. Franklin, I am proposing not one, but two houses of Congress. One being a House of Representatives based on population count, and the other a Senate with two representatives from each state. And while we're at it, an executive and judicial branch of government, too. This way, legislative, executive, and judicial branches can work within the same system of, uh, ooh, uh... Let's just call it a system of checks and balances. This could work, my friend. However, there is still the lingering problem of slavery in counting that population. Well, if it were up to me, and as some men in this room know, it should be up to me, I would call for the complete and utter abolition of slavery in the states, no slavery in any new territory or state settled in the West, and the ability to have the newly freed peoples counted as free and equal individuals. Oh, and I would also call for the slave-owning population to, uh, get off their lazy asses and do some actual work for once in their lives. Tom! <laughs> well, that simply isn't gonna happen, my loud friend. What about counting the slaves as a fraction of a person to lower the population in the slave states? James Wilson, you are a Pennsylvanian and a liberal. Why would you even entertain such a backwards-thinking idea? It's the only way to get everyone to agree here, Mr. Stard, and I think everyone here knows it. It's that or we give states like Georgia and Virginia the power to reshape America into a slave-owning nation. He's right, Thebadias. I do fear that this may be the only way to reach our southern friends. It's a disgusting way to do it. Agreed. Hear, hear. Order, gentlemen, order. Let us recess before the committee draws up a draft of this compromise, and then the convention will take a vote. And with that, the quote-unquote great compromise was made and slavery ingrained into our Constitution, describing enslaved people as quote-unquote other persons. God, that is disgusting. Agreed. You heard me say as much during the convention. Ugh. Anyways, sometime after that, the Constitution was completed and sent to the states to be ratified. Wait, but there still wasn't a Bill of Rights. That is indeed correct. By the end of the convention, everyone was so worn out that they refused to even consider a Bill of Rights, especially when Hamilton was being his annoying self and pushing hard to have the Constitution pass as is without an amendment. Our magnificent Bill of Rights would finally be added when a few states like Virginia signaled that they wouldn't ratify the Constitution without one. Crazy. Who would have thought the pro-slavery South would be responsible for getting a Bill of Rights? Yes, it really bobbles the mind. Uh, I think it's boggles. No, I'm pretty sure it's bobbles, as in bobblehead, in this case meaning the irony of the pro-slave South getting people basic rights makes one's head shake like a bobblehead due to the absolute bewilderment. I mean, yeah, but I still think it's boggles with two Gs. Well, I say you're wrong, and as I am a demigod, we'll assume I'm right. Besides, when has a god ever been wrong? Objectively, all of the time. Well, you're still wrong about the two Gs in bobble. Speaking of two Gs, I could use a couple grand right about now, so we'll go to commercial. Hopefully the royalties from these ads will be paid in lesser bills like 20s and 50s, as I like using stacks of them as decorations around my various mansions and giga yachts. 
So get to buying things, America. Daddy needs a fat stack of cash. Ugh, please don't call yourself Daddy. Yeah, I felt gross saying it. We'll be right back. It's America, the podcast! America, the podcast is brought to you by Poison for Ant Hills. Poison for Ant Hills. Commit genocide completely guilt-free while making your useless lawn look healthy. America, the podcast is brought to you by Cocaine in the 80s. And Cocaine in the 80s was brought to you by the CIA. The CIA, America's drug dealer of choice for over 70 years. Back with the last act of the season finale of my very important show and the first podcast that will one day win a Tony Award. America, the podcast presents the American Revolution. How could the show win a Tony? It's not a stage production and doesn't have music. The Tony Awards aren't just about song and dance, Timothy. But if you test me, I will make this show a musical. Okay, fine. Have your dreams of Broadway fame. Well, I already ghost wrote Jesus Christ Superstar, but Andrew Lloyd Webber will never admit to that, and his lawyers keep telling me that I can't admit to it either. Whatever that means. Right. So what's left? Uh, Washington's presidency or something? Well, not exactly. Why, yes, I could discuss how he refused to help the French in their war against the English, or how he refused to help free Thomas Paine Paine. from a Parisian prison during the French Revolution, or how he helped squash the Whiskey Rebellion by being the only sitting president to lead an army. That sounds pretty cool. And I'm sure it was, but I wasn't there, so we can't view it. Where were you during the Whiskey Rebellion? Uh, I believe the term is hardcore chilling. At the exact moment of the Whiskey Rebellion, I was likely eating a whole chocolate cake in my bathtub at home. (laughs) That's fucking awesome. Indeed. And it's part of my regular Friday routine now. That and marathoning selling sunset. And yes, fucking awesome are words to describe me and just about everything I do. However, what wasn't fucking awesome was the hard time people had with the tax on whiskey. You see, whiskey itself was basically currency in western Pennsylvania. The tax forced people to pay in gold or silver, which was more or less unavailable to rural communities. A similar incident happened a few years earlier with Shay's Rebellion, when a group of disgruntled, unpaid former soldiers shut down debtors' courts. Their rebellion aimed to prevent people from going to prison for unpaid debts, which they couldn't pay due to not being paid themselves after the revolution. Did you have a hand in squashing their rebellions? Absolutely not. As the embodiment of an only hope for America, and a revolutionary soldier myself, I was sympathetic to their cause, but was also bound by my devotion to Congress and did not aid in either rebellion. General Washington was also sympathetic, but still had to do his duty. The job of the president always weighed on the man. He was elected unanimously in 1789 at the age of 57 and then pressured to run for his second term. His devotion to our country was as strong as mine, and, if not for me, he likely would have gone on to another term out of sheer duty. Ta, duty. (laughs) Okay, um, wait, hold on. Did you convince George Washington to set the two-term limit? Indeed. It was a night like any other, one that would not be recorded in the history books until now. I sat with Washington in his office at our nation's then capital, New York City. He had grown tired of the presidential day-to-day, and it was beginning to wear him out. There were even times when he would be at dinner with delegates and he would mindlessly tap his spoon on a glass out of sheer boredom. As we sat in his office sipping claret, we got to talking about what would be next for our country. Ugh, I'm tired, Thebidias. Would you like me to leave so that you may retire for the evening, Mr. President? No, Mr. Stard, I'm still wide awake from the coca leaf tea you gave me earlier. Where was that from again? A country called Columbia in the southern continent. Fascinating. No, I mean I've grown tired of life as Mr. President. Also, I still would have preferred His Excellency so I didn't have to shake people's hands. Yes, I do see your point, sir, but it is my belief that our country would only survive with a leader that people can admire. His Excellency would have been too close to the monarchical title that you wanted to avoid. Ugh, 
You may be right, Mr. Stard. Do you think you may want to retire at the end of this term? My body says yes, but my duty drives me to serve. Well, sir, if you don't mind me saying, I think the best form of service would be to retire. What do you mean, my friend? Well, sir, America doesn't want a monarch. To stay in power and not pass the reins to another would slowly turn our democracy into a dictatorship. Agreed. I fear there are some among us that wish to become such a tyrant. Thomas Jefferson? Thomas Jefferson. Ta. Yes, I couldn't agree more, sir. You, however, are one of the most honorable men I know. You are beloved by all to the point of being deified by some. That is why you should set the precedent for being president by ending your service at two terms. Hmm. Do you think that's long enough? Well, for the sake of the country, I would say so, yes. Three terms would be ideal as you are learning to be the president in the first while assuring your re-election. The second term would show what you can do and the third would reveal the fruits of the first two administrations labor. Maybe that could become necessary someday, but for now, I think we are in a good place for you to let go, Mr. President. Yes, and I know Martha would appreciate it. I have been fighting and leading others to do the same for far too long, my friend. You're right. This should be the end. I'm happy to hear it, sir. You deserve a rest. Who would you pick as a successor? Democratically elected, of course. Well, I was thinking of endorsing you. Haha. <laughs> I am flattered, sir. However, I am the one person who cannot. Nonsense! You are one of the heroes of Yorktown, Trenton, Princeton, Bunker Hill, and Lexington and Concord. You were the spy master of the revolution, and you dictated the Declaration of Independence. Not to mention, your letter of advocation to Lord Shelburne solidified our peace treaty with the Crown. The list goes on, my friend. Yes, Mr. President, while I do realize the reasons aren't lacking, I- And you brought the nation Lafayette. Lafayette. Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. I will never get used to that. Is there a problem, Mr. Stard? Uh, no, sir, but also, yes, sir. I believe there's something you should know about me. And I believe you may already know in your heart, but may not have let your mind believe it yet. Ah, you're different, are you not? Indeed I am, sir. Yes, I've always suspected something. I've spoken with Mr. Hamilton and the Marquis about it on a few occasions. Mr. Franklin even wrote to me requesting that I keep you close. So, please, I believe your president is owed an explanation. Right. Uh, well, uh, I cannot be our nation's leader because I am our nation. What does that even mean? Uh, well, uh... The evening I spoke our Declaration of Independence into existence, I came home and sat down to relax. After a few minutes, I suddenly heard the bellowing voice of someone who called themselves the voice of the old and new gods. They proceeded to tell me that I had been selected to be the physical embodiment of this nation and only hope for its survival. I was also tasked with being the guardian of all of the people in this great land, and in return, I was granted immortality and have become a demigod. Yes, I thought as much. Uh, really, sir? Because a lot of that was very specific. Well, I don't know how to explain it, but I could feel it in my bones, old friend. Being around you during our revolution always felt, uh, right. A lot of the time, it seemed like you were our good luck charm. I was just doing my duty, sir. Ha! Given who you are, I think you can drop the sir at this point, Thebedias. You can just call me George. No, sir. You are our nation's leader, and therefore mine. To me, you and every other person who will hold this great office will always be Mr. President. Very well, then. Hmm. Since you cannot lead our nation and have already been tasked as its caretaker, I would like to make one final request of you as your general and president. By all means, sir. I am at your service. Very good. Since you have been gifted with immortality, I want you to keep an eye on each and every president that comes after me. I am sure one of them might try and hold on to power for far longer than necessary at some point. I also request that you keep our underground state active. Recruit people with political and business influence to join your ranks. Military types too, but recruit from their ranks as needed. Simply put, your orders are to keep our nation safe from any threat, foreign or domestic. Militaristic or political, no matter what the circumstance, you must safeguard our nation, Thebedias Stard. Is that understood? Indeed, Mr. President. You have my word. Very good, my friend. Uh, so, Alexander Hamilton is kind of a lot, 
right? Oh my god, I wasn't going to say anything because you both seem so close, but I wholeheartedly agree, Mr. President. Ha! Huh? We're only close because he latches onto me like a leech. <laughs> Indeed. It's probably best he can't be president, right? Well, I'll say this. I would highly advise against it. He really needs to be less confrontational. I swear, his running mouth will be the death of him one day. Agreed. More claret, Mr. America? Don't mind if I do, Mr. President. Don't mind if I do. Whoa, dude. Did he just order you to keep the deep state going? Indeed he did. I would go on to recruit people from all walks of life, as long as they were influential and or wealthy. Seems pretty classist. Did I give you the impression that I was anything but? Irregardless, there's still a few pores in the deep state that I recruited. Hell, you're technically one of them just by association with me. Oh, I don't like that. Why am I a member of the deep state? Well, to use the non-answer every parent uses when they don't know how to answer their child. <clears throat> because I said so. Uh, I don't know why I even try to fight. Neither do I, my friend. Neither do I. Uh, you know what? Whatever. Just end the season. I'm gonna go get a drink. Just hit stop when you're done. Very well. I'll take an old fashion if you're making- Ah, he left. Very well then. Anyways, as for President Washington and I, we drank three more bottles of claret that night while reminiscing about the war and talking about how stupid Horatio Gates was. Washington wasn't the best man, but he was still my president. Flawed as he might have been, without George Washington, as well as many other dedicated patriots, we would not have our nation. The sacrifices we all made were many, but necessary. Not a single nation has been formed without sacrifice. Not a single ideal has been met without opposition. Our war was long, and it still goes on to this very day. The war for the heart of America. Each and every one of you listening to my very important words has likely been met with some kind of adversity in your life. You may think that these hardships will get the better of you, but to that I shout, STAY steadfast, AMERICA! There are those who will hold you back, of course, and attempt to keep you under their thumb. But know this, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights are and will always be inalienable. That said, my call on each one of you in the same spirit that I too was called, to fight for a better country. Fight for a better America. Our nation is capable of so much more than our current societal state. Be diligent and one day our nation will see the fruits of your dedication. If you keep your spirit alive, we will one day be the nation that people can look to as the shining example of equality, freedom, and hope. For now, our American Revolution continues. To the activists, teachers, the civil servants, to all who are working tirelessly to make America a better place for future generations, as the embodiment of this nation, I thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. Finally, I wanted to thank you for listening to my very important story this past year, America. I truly hope you enjoyed my tale of our revolution and have been inspired to take up the mantle of revolutionary yourself. That's it for Season 5, America. I'm going home to eat a chocolate cake in my bathtub. I will be in your ears again soon. Stay safe, and as always, good night and good fight. It's America, the podcast! This has been America the Podcast presents the American Revolution. The show is produced and distributed by Shway Media and is part of the Shway Media Podcast Network. The show was created by Tim Philippi and is hosted by me, Thabadias A. Starred, a.k.a. The Bastard, a.k.a. The Embodiment of an Only Hope for America. Writers for my very important show and social media platforms include Tim Philippi, Alana Matos, Andrew K. Turner, Alexa Schreffler, and of course me, Thabadias A. Starred. Producers for America the Podcast are Tim Philippi and Alana Matos. Due to some audio issues we experienced while traveling through the space-time continuum or something dumb like that, additional voices heard in this episode were provided by Febadias Stard, Andrew K. Turner as Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth, and Tim Philippi. Alana Matos provides the voice for the mid-show commercials. The show's theme song is by Timmy Two-Step, and all other music and sound effects heard in this show were provided by Storyblocks, Freesound.org, the Library of Congress, Ambient Mixer, Soundcrate, Accusonus, and Sonus. Lots of Sonuses out there. 
The show is available on all podcast directories and YouTube. While reviews on any and all podcast apps are greatly appreciated, I humbly request you leave a five-star review in iTunes so that we may finally overtake the political podcast dynasty known as Pod Safe America. They're not even funny. We know funny. Wait, do we know funny? Oh, we do not. Okay, well then, um, let's take them anyways, America. For America! For video messages such as previously on America, did you know this, and America's word of the day, or get out Greg, or kick out Kemp, or any of the other ones, follow the show on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook at America the Podcast. And don't forget to check out all of the other spectacular shows on the Shway Media Podcast Network at shwaymedia.com. That's S-H-W-A-Y media.com. All right, that's it. The season's over. Leave. Why are you still here? Go. I mean, go home. You don't need to be here. I need to leave. So does Tim. His, well, his time's not valuable. Mine is. But leave. Okay, if you're not going to leave, do you at least want to get something to eat? I'll, I will get us pizza, as per the usual. All right, all right. Uh, would you like to watch The Mandalorian? I love that show. I don't care what Tim says. Baby Yoda is real. And for that matter, Ferris Bueller isn't real, and the whole thing was in Cameron's head. See you next season, America. Good night and good fight. Again. This has been a production of Shway Media, all rights reserved. For more information, please visit shwaymedia.com.